This is the biblical doctrine of bibliology, the study of the Bible, and we're seeking to answer the question, how we got our Bible. We have explored and looked at the doctrine of inspiration. We have looked at the organization of the Bible. We've looked at the collection of the Bible. And now we're going to look at the biblical doctrine of the preservation of the Word of God. This concept of preservation is that God has sovereignly and providentially um, overseen the existence of the holy scriptures so that they have not been lost or destroyed. Now the first question we want to ask in light of this doctrine is where are the original manuscripts? Where are the writings that the prophets wrote down, these messages which they received as oracles from God? Where are the writings in which they wrote to preserve that very truth. <clears throat> well, we can say this concerning those original documents. We do not have one shred of the originals, these original manuscripts. Why? Because the materials on which they were written has been disintegrated. They simply just do not exist. They have deteriorated and disintegrated over time. Now this causes us to ask another question. Why do you think God has allowed the originals to, uh, to not be preserved? Why has God allowed those, those copies which he has um, preserved or that he, has, he had produced through the prophets and apostles, why did he not allow them to be preserved? Well, we can speculate and we can say that um, God knew that they would be worshipped. He knew that they would become idols. And so he did not, did not allow the originals to be preserved. Now, we can look at an example of this even within the scriptures. If you remember back into the, the book of Numbers, when Israel was disobedient to God and God had sent a plague through snakes, deadly snakes had come into the camp of Israel, began to attack them, and the Israelites were dying out. And Moses interceded for the Israelites who were living in disobedience and defiance to God. And God instructed Moses to build a bronze serpent. And he said, lift up this bronze serpent. And anyone who has been bitten by these poisonous snakes, anyone who looks at this bronze serpent will be healed and will not die. So we ask the question, fast forward uh, past that time period into the time of the kings, and we ask the question, what happened to that bronze serpent that Moses had made in the wilderness in order to um, be a savior type uh, for the nation of Israel? What happened to them? Well, we find in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 4, we see this very thing. It says, he removed the high places smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He, he broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had began to burn incense to it. So they took this thing that God had given as a means of grace and they turned it into an idol to worship it. And this is very true of many things within the Christian faith today. You think of uh, cloth that believe that was believed to be a part of Jesus's um, burial site or or uh, the hair or the clothes of John the Baptist and people idolize these things and they make gods out of these things just because they have some significance to um, their faith but they are not God and they should not be worshipped or idolized as such. So we can speculate as that being one of the reasons why God has not allowed his word to the original manuscripts to be preserved. But there's actually a, 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 a more definitive reason for why um, these original writings have not been preserved. And it has to do with the materials on which they were produced. They were produced on materials that, that could not last Forever, um, We see this progression throughout history, the, the popular forms of materials that were used in order to write down things with language. We think of uh, ostraca. Ostraca, these were pieces of stone and clay um, that, were, that were broken and discarded pieces of pottery. So people would actually take these broken pieces of pottery and use them as a means of, of writing things down. 
and there there was no way that those things um, on those materials could have um, lasted forever. We think of parchment, the parchment paper, um, and these were simply pieces of sheepskin that had been dried out and straightened. And of course, even these things eventually became brittle and aged and disintegrated. And then there was the evolution of paper or papyrus, and the use of papyrus marked a great improvement in writing materials. <clears throat> These were woven from papyri reeds, so they came from plants. The stalk of the papyri reed was peeled down to the pith, and then it, uh, and and this was then crushed and pulverized into a sheet of fibrous matter. So, so there was a process that they went through in order to prepare this material to be an improvement to, in order for documenting things. But however, even with these great improvements in this material, um, this material could still be deteriorated over time or destroyed by water or fire or overuse. So we answer the question, where are the original manuscripts? By saying that they no longer exist. They have disintegrated. They have, they have uh, deceased. They're, they're no longer with us. So how then do we have the word of God? Because the original manuscripts were copied. They were copied. This is the concept of transmission, where a document, the, the content from one document, is then transferred to a new document on different materials so as to keep the content over time, even though the original document um, is deteriorating and disintegrating. And so this brings up yet another question. Can I trust the copies of the original manuscripts? Can we trust the documents that were copies of the originals? And we would propose to you as Christians, we propose that they very that the copies of the manuscripts are very much trustworthy. And we want to look at three major reasons how we can know that the copies of the original manuscripts are trustworthy. The first issue we want to look at is the scribal accuracy. Scribal accuracy. Scribes were individuals who were basically paid in order to write and transmit documents. This was their profession. This is what they did for a living. A living. And within the Jewish community, um, those who had and contained and possessed the Old Testament writings of the Hebrew Bible, this was a profoundly important job for them, they took their job very seriously and with pride and with reverence in their copying of these um, documents because they believed that this was truly the word of God. So they counted every single letter as they copied. And if they had made one mistake, they would start over. The scribes were militant. They were diligent in order to make sure that they had produced documents without error. They took great care and great detail in order to preserve these very things. And so they set up a system, a regimented system, a specific system. They had a routine. They had a ritual. They had a rhetoric that they would follow in order to do this process of copying and transmitting the scriptures. So that's the first reason that we know that the copies of the Old Testament were <clears throat> uh, very much reliable. Secondly, we know that the copies can be trusted because there are so many copies of the, of the, uh, of the original manuscripts that have been circulated throughout time. And because there are so many, they can keep each other accountable to what they say. We know what the, what the original said by and large because we have such a large source through which we can, we can detect and decipher to see what the originals had stated. Let's look more specifically at the Old Testament um, manuscripts. Okay, So we're going to talk about the agreements that, are, that exist within the manuscripts. Manuscript agreement. This is the concept that all of the copies agree with each other. They essentially say the same thing, and therefore we can trust that they, they are communicating what the originals had stated. So when we take a look at the Old Testament and the copies of the manuscripts there, we see that it, during the first part of the 20th century, the oldest existing Hebrew manuscripts um, of the Old Testament dated back to 900 AD. Those were the oldest ones that we had copies of. 
the, the oldest ones. Um, and however, this then all changed because of the remarkable discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. Many of these scrolls dated back to the second century before Christ. So before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest manuscript we had was from 900 AD. When they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, there were within that group of, of documents, uh, statements or copies of the Word of God that dated all the way back to the time before Christ, 125 BC. So there's a thousand year gap in between, in between our oldest ones that we had and then what the Dead Sea Scrolls provided. There's a thousand year gap. So the question then becomes, how accurate were these copies in relationship to the copies that were made in 125 BC? There's a thousand years worth of potential for mistakes and error and changes to occur. But what was the actual percentage? What kinds of changes did we see taking place over that hundred year period of time? Well, we can say this much. In one chapter of 166 words in Isaiah 53, there is only one word, three letters in question after a thousand years of transmission. There is only one word, three letters in question after 1,000 years of copying. That's it. That's amazing. You look at these documents from 900 AD and these documents from 125 AD and you compare them and there's only that kind of small, minute change that has taken place over time. This is amazing. And this example that I just shared with you is typical of the whole Isaiah manuscript, that there is nothing of great detail that has been changed that would affect any significant meaning of any passage or any doctrine that Christians hold to. This is amazing. These copies of the Old Testament manuscripts were proven uh, once again to be extremely accurate and the process of copying them has proven itself trustworthy. Now, what do we do when we look at the New Testament copies? The copies of the uh, original manuscripts of the New Testament, the, the four Gospels and the uh, letters of Paul and so forth and so on. Well, the best way of discerning the reliability of the copies of the New Testament is by comparing them to other documents of antiquity, uh, uh, documents that were produced a long, long ago. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the New Testament manuscripts to the writing, to a very old writing called Homer's Iliad. We're going to compare the two of them and see uh, how their copying and their transmission uh, uh, compares to one another. So first, let's look at the Iliad. The Iliad was written about 900 BC, 900 years before the life of Jesus. And it is now accepted as a classic of world literature. How old is its oldest manuscript? The earliest manuscript of the Iliad dates around 400, around 400 BC. So the Iliad was written in 900 BC. The oldest documents that we have of the Iliad is 400 BC. That's a 500 year gap, 500 years in between the, the original writing and the closest copy of that writing that we contain. How many manuscripts of the Iliad do you suppose exist today? The answer, 643. 643 manuscript copies of the Iliad, this classic of antiquity. And of its 1,500, or excuse me, 15,600 lines, how many of those are in doubt? How many of those within the manuscript comparison are doubted um, to have been changed and disagree with each other? Um, <clears throat> the answer is, amongst all of those lines, 764 of those lines are in doubt or in question. This is 
So when you look at the, those documents that have been produced, those copies of the original story of the Iliad, when you look at the copies of the manuscripts and you compare them, there is only a 4.9% difference in them, showing that that transmission is trustworthy and by and large, what we read today of the Iliad is 95% certain to be what was written and produced in the original document. Okay, so now we have seen these statistics about Homer's The Iliad. Now let's look at the, the, um, the body of the New Testament documents and compare ourselves, compare them and their transmission as well. How many manuscript copies or portions of the New Testament do you suppose are in existence today? We have we have uh, 643 of Homer's The Iliad. Well, of the New Testament, we have, uh, which was written in what, and completed by 100 AD, we have over 24,000 copies of the original manuscripts. <clears throat> and within that, there are 20 thousand lines 20,000 lines within the New Testament and of those 20,000 lines how many are do you suppose are in doubt because of disagreements among the copies the answer the words <clears throat> the words in doubt add up to about 40 lines 40 lines Ooh. 40 lines are in doubt what's the percentage of that of questionable lines within uh, the copies of the uh, the New Testament. 0.2%, less than 1% of uh, the writings are in question and in doubt. Look at the attestation that we have, the accuracy and reliability of the transmission of the New Testament, that almost nothing is in question at all. And when we look at the disagreements, 19 out of 20 of the disagreements that we find or variants that are um, within the copies of the manuscripts, they are minor, they are misspellings, they are copying errors, and none affect the, fun the fundamental doctrines of Scripture. So we can see that the, the, the copies of the original manuscripts are certainly trustworthy and reliable. As a New Testament scholar put it, F.F. Uh, Bruce wrote, there is no body of ancient literature in, in the world which enjoys such a rich and good a wealth of textual attestation as the New Testament. There is no other literature documents that has the kind of support of its accuracy that the New Testament uh, found in the Ju uh, Judeo-Christian scriptures has. It is fundamentally supported and strongly supported. So that's the second reason we know that we can trust the copies of the manuscript. We have scribal accuracy, and then we have manuscript agreement. Now we want to look at a third point. This would be biblical agreement, the, or excuse me, biblical acknowledgement. Biblical acknowledgement. What do we mean by that? that we, we can look at the scriptures and we can notice the attitude of those who wrote the scriptures and those who are alive during the, the times that the scriptures were produced and we see how they handled the scriptures at, of their time. Notice how the New Testament demonstrates the reliability of the copies of the Old Testament that were uh, in existence in that day. Look at the following examples of Christ and of Paul uh, using um, minute details of Scripture to make their points. So the, the writers of the New Testament and the, those who lived during the time that the Old Testament was the only uh, Bible that was available, the Hebrew Bible, look at their attitude towards the Hebrew Bible, towards its reliability, towards its transmission, towards the very words that are located there. Let's look at how Jesus uses the Hebrew Bible. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is arguing with the scribes and the Pharisees. He's debating them, and he goes directly to the Word of God in order to prove his point. And if we look at Jesus' word found in verse 31 and 32, Jesus... <coughs> 
Jesus um, re rebukes and, and he rebuts the arguments of the, um, of the Sadducees. And he says this in verse 31. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Notice what Jesus does here. Jesus is arguing for the resurrection of the dead. Jesus is arguing for the existence and the reality of the afterlife. And he quotes the Old Testament. And he points to the very tense of a word. As God spoke, he said, I am the God of Abraham. And this was spoken long after Abraham's death. So Jesus points to the tense of a word in order to support his argument that Abraham is not dead. He's alive, existing after his physical departure. So Jesus uses the present tense of a verb to make his point. If we go further down and look at verse 45, <clears throat> Jesus again argues and he's talking about um, who the Christ is, the identity of the Messiah, and he's arguing with the religious leaders there. And in verse 45 of Matthew 22, he says this, if then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Jesus argues that the Messiah pre-exists David. He comes before David and is greater than David just by hanging on the one word, Lord, that we find there. We can look at Jesus again arguing with the Pharisees, debating with them in John's Gospel in chapter 10. In John chapter 10, <clears throat> Jesus... Um, argues again from a single word. Look at verse 34 and 35 of John chapter 10. He says, he says, um, uh, Jesus says this in John chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, the word of God? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father has set apart as his very own and sent into the world? So Jesus argues for his position and his place of authority um, from arguing from the Psalms and one word referring to humanity, those who were rulers, those who were appointed as overseers and managers of God's creation, God called them and referred to them as gods. And so uh, we see Jesus arguing from one single word to prove his point. And the Apostle Paul latches on to this same very concept, and he also trusts the scriptures and the transmission of the scriptures as he argues in the book of Galatians. <clears throat> In Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes concerning the Christ, the Messiah. He says this in verse 16. He says, The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Paul is arguing that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham by focusing on the fact that there is a word that is not plural, but it is singular. A singular word, the word seed, and not the plural form, seeds. And so we see that the Bible acknowledges the reliability of the word of God. Paul depended on the trustworthiness and reliable reliability of the scriptures. Jesus trusted in and depended upon the reliability and the transmission of the scriptures of the Old Testament. So we see, thus, if Jesus and the Apostle Paul believed that every word was important and could be trusted, then so should we. And now we move on to our final, <clears throat> our final question. Can we trust our Bibles? Can I trust my Bible? Can, the Bible that I hold in my hand, do I know that it is indeed the Word of God? Is my Bible, the one I'm holding, the Word of God? Can I trust it? The first comment I want to make concerning this is that just because the Bible refers to 
other books does not mean that they were inspired. The Bible quotes from extra biblical sources within it. <laughs> that does not mean that those writings are inspired. It does not mean that those Bibles belong, or excuse me, those writings belong in the canon of Scripture. Um, the Bible does make reference to them, to books that can no longer be found. So a question that we have to ask is, what about those books? Is it possible that some of them or all of those books that are mentioned in the Bible are inspired and should be included in the canon? No, not at all. We see many uh, uses of historical documents quoted in the Bible, but it doesn't mean that those authors of those writings have been inspired. We see the great historian Josephus, um, who wrote a lot about the, and chronicled the history of Israel and, the, and their dealings with the nations around them. That doesn't mean that Josephus' writings were inspired or authoritative from God. And so we can trust that the, the writings that we have um, are the writings of God and that that is what God has preserved for us and what he intended for us. Now, we can also make this statement. If God cared enough to write a book for us, he also cared enough to preserve it. Preserve it for us. And we see Peter mentioned this very thing, the nature of the word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he says heaven and earth will pass away, but uh, God's word will remain forever. And this is a truth that God is preserving his word over time that all generations might know the truth and believe. And finally, if God created all languages, all languages. He designed them to be translated into other languages. With accuracy. See, the original writings, the original manuscripts were produced in the Hebrew language, the Aramaic language, and the Greek language. But they have to be translated into our language that we might be able to read and understand. But God has created language, therefore God knows that, that one language can be transferred and uh, translated into other languages with accuracy that we might know exactly what God communicated through his prophets and apostles, even though he spoke to them in other languages that we do not know ourselves. And so we see <coughs> that, um, that God's word is trustworthy. In conclusion, we see the evidence is in favor of the divine inspiration of the Bible. It is the, in, in the final analysis, we must accept the accuracy and authority of God's word by faith. There's a difference between proof and persuasion. We have given uh, many, many um, evidences to support the trustworthiness, the reliability of the Old and the New Testament of the Holy Scriptures that we call the Bible. But ultimately, you have to trust that those things are accurate. If a man chooses not to believe in God's word, regardless of how many proofs we give, there is nothing more that we can do for them than other, to, other than to commit to prayer that the Holy Spirit would penetrate their hardened hearts. But the real question here is, what about you? Do you believe the Bible? Do you trust the Bible? The Bible is a collection, a compilation of ancient writings where men were moved along by the Holy Spirit to speak messages of revelation that God had revealed to them for the purpose of um, bringing the world and humanity into the knowledge of God and his offer of salvation. They are documents that record the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has paid for our sins. The question is, are you trusting in the gospel? Are you trusting in Jesus? And in order to do that, you must trust his word where God has spoken to us and revealed to us his means of salvation.
Can we trust our Bible? Most certainly. We have seen many proofs of this very thing, and we can know with confidence that what we read today is what God inspired and moved the writers, the original writers, to write in those original manuscripts. This is the doctrine of the preservation of the Word of God. 